Welcome to Got the Conversations. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. And today I'm going to be talking about the third commandment. That's right, working on Sundays. Is it permissible? Uh, here's a sneak peek. The answer is no, it's not permissible. You cannot work on Sundays. But what exactly does that mean? What exactly qualifies as work on Sunday? What is serve our work? So all that will be covered today. And it's not going to be my opinions on it. I'm going to give you St. Alphonse Liguori. I'm going to give you St. John Vianney. I'm going to give you the Council of Trent. I'm going to give you Pius XII. All these things will be covered in this episode. So stay tuned. But before I forget, let's uh, let me, uh, plug, make sure you like, subscribe, hit the bell notification, comment down below. Uh, comment even though you may not have anything to say just comment something like thanks or whatever because it helps with the youtube algorithm so if you want to uh, help out the podcast then i highly recommend commenting liking sharing subscribing and hitting the bell notification or any number of those things okay without further ado i'm going to go straight into it and for this podcast i did not want to cover my own ideas my, I wanted to make sure that this was actually just the teachings of the church uh, because I actually don't really quite know what the right answer is. I don't know the way to do it because it gets quite complicated. It's not easy to distinguish what counts as serve our work what, and to make all these prudential decisions and people have questions like, okay, what about this situation? What about that situation? And I'm not your pastor. I'm not a saint. I'm not someone special. I probably violate the, the commandments just as much as everyone else. And so I figured it'd be better if I just read to you what the saints say, and then you can make up your mind on how to apply that to your life and I'll leave it to you to make those prudential decisions. So I'm going to start off with St. Alphonse Liguori and his com in the complete ascetical work, St. Alphonse Liguori, here's commentary on the third commandment. The third chapter, uh, the complete ascetical work, St. Alphonse Liguori, chapter three, the third commandment, remember to sanctify the Sabbath day. This precept imposes two obligations. The first is to abstain from servile work on Sundays and holy days. The second is to hear mass on these days. In the old law, the festival day was Saturday, but the apostles changed it to Sunday, a day sanctified by God over and over again, as St. Louis has remarked. For it was on Sunday that the world was created, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and that the Holy Ghost descended on the apostles. The precept of sanctifying the Sunday, according to St. Thomas, and the gener generality of the theologians, is moral, so far as it is the duty of all men to employ some part of their life in the worship of God but ceremonial so far as it determines the exact time of this worship. So far as it is moral, all men are bound to observe it. As a ceremonial precept, it is no longer obligatory because the old law has ceased. Hence, we are bound to be to the observance of festivals by a precept of the church, which has determined the days that are to be kept holy. I now ask, why has God instituted festival days? He has instituted them that every Christian Christian having attended to the concerns of his body during the other days of the week, may attend on the festivals to the concern of his soul, not only by hearing Mass, but also by hearing a sermon, visiting the Blessed Sacrament, recommending himself to God, and by performing other acts of piety. But how do many persons spend the holy days in gambling and drinking to excess and obscene discourses? I may here tell you a story related by Surius. In the city of Dia, there was a holy bishop called Stephen. Being unable to correct a great irregularity among the people who spent the holidays and Sundays in gambling, dancing, and drunkenness, he begged of God that multitude of hideous devils might appear in the city on a certain day. So it happened, and so much terror was excited that all cried aloud for mercy. The people promised to amend, and the holy bishop, by his prayers, delivered them from these horrible monsters." The, holy, the obligation of abstaining from servile works. How many kinds of works are there? It is necessary to distinguish three kinds of works. Servile, liberal, and common. Servile works, as St. Thomas teaches, are in the mystic sense sense. But literally, they are the works that are usually performed only by servants. They are also called corporal works, such as building, digging, sewing, working iron, stone, or wood and similar occupations which require bodily labor. These are, properly speaking, the works which are forbidden in the old law. You shall do no servile work thereon. 
Second, liberal works or occupations, which are called works of the mind, are those that are performed by men in a liberal condition of life, such as to study, to teach, to play music, to write, and the like. These are permitted on holy days, even though performed for gain. Theologians also reckon transcribing among the liberal works because transcribing is connected with the instruction of the mind. Third, finally, common works, called also intermediate works, are those that are performed not only by servants, but also by men in a liberal condition of life. Which are the works forbidden on festivals? On festivals, servile works are only are prohibited, but not those which are called liberal or common. This is the doctrine of theologians who follow the opinion of St. Thomas. Corporal works that have nothing to do with the ceremonies of worship are called servile only so far as they are properly belong to servants, but not so when they are commonly performed, as well by persons of liberal conditions as by servants. Before this passage, the saint had explained that in the precept of sanctifying holy days, servile works only are understood to be forbidden. Hence, according to the more common and more probable opinion, it is not forbidden on holidays to travel or to foul, because these are at least common to persons in a servile and liberal condition of life. Fishing, when attended with great labor, appears to be a servile work, as may be inferred from the canon law in which the Pope has given the dispensation to fish for sardines. It is necessary to remark that the third commandment forbids all work connected with the law courts, such as to cite parties, to carry on trials, to pronounce or execute sentences, unless they are excused by necessity or piety. It is also forbidden on festivals to sell goods in public shops, but this is permitted at fairs and markets where it is the custom to do so or when the things sold are necessary for daily use, such as food, wine, beer, and the like. Third, what causes permit servile work on a holiday? One, a dispensation of the bishop or even of the parish priest when there is a just cause for dispensation excuses servile work on festivals. Servile work on holidays is excused by any custom existing in the place provided the custom is permitted and not censured by the bishop. Charity, or third, charity, or the relief of a neighbor who is in need is a sufficient excuse. Fourth, necessity, as when a person would not have food for the day if he did not work, or when a person works in order to avoid a grievous loss. Hence, it is lawful to reap corn, to gather grapes in the, vin- in the vintage, to gather corn, hay, olives, chestnuts, and other fruits that are in the danger of being damaged. It is also lawful to do whatever is necessary for the day, such as prepare food, to arrange and sweep the house, to make the beds, etc., Fifth, piety excuses servile work. This, thus, it is lawful to cultivate the ground belonging to poor churches or to build them through charity. But this cannot be done without the leave of the bishop or without great actual necessity. Sixth, smallness of matter excuses from the violation of the precept. But what should be considered to be sufficient matter for mortal sin? Some theologians say that to work for an hour is a mortal sin. Others extend that time to two hours. But unless there is a just cause, a shortness of time employed in work does not excuse from venial sin. Fourth conclusion. Some will not work on the other days of the week and holidays. They are not ashamed to work for half the day and even compel their servants and children to work. Father, they say, we are poor, but it is not every kind of poverty that excuses from working on festivals. Your poverty or necessity must be such that unless you work, you will not have food for the day for yourself and for your family. Everyone who lives by his labor is poor, and in some necessity, but such necessity does not excuse from sin. Let children remember that when a parent commands them to work on a holiday, in opposition to the law of God, they are not bound to obey him. On the contrary, if they work, they are guilty of sin. They are excused from sin only when, if they do not work, they will suffer a great loss, or at least a grievous inconvenience. For the precepts of the church are not binding when the observance of them is attended with grievous inconvenience. But the servants of a master who obliges them to work on holidays of obligation, on holy days of obligation, should plainly say to him, This is a holiday. I am a Christian, and I will not work. If the master compels them by grievous threats, it is their duty to leave him and to seek a master who observes the Christian law. I will tell you how God punishes those who work on holidays of obligation. In the Diocese of Fano, in the Pontifical States, they were celebrating the Feast of St. Ursus. The bishop and the patron of the place, a countryman, went on that day to plow as usual. And when he was asked why he did not respect the festival of St. Ursus, he answered, If he is Ursus, I am a man in want of bread. 
At these words, the earth opened and swallowed him up alive with his plow and oxen. And the marks of the chasm was still to be seen in the place where it happened, which is now called Villa de Rosano. My good man, what do you expect? Do you imagine that by working on festivals, you will improve your fortune? You are mistaken. By your work, you will only increase your misery. There were two shoemakers. One of them lived in comfort with his family. The other, though he was always working Sundays and weekdays, was ever starving and had nothing to give his children. This man began once to complain of his misery and said to the others, Who always observe the festivals? Friend, how do you contrive to live? I work and toil unceasingly, and yet I am not able to provide food for my family. The other replied, I have a friend to whom I go every morning. He supplies me with whatever I, need, I want. The former, former rejoined, Introduce me to your kind friend. The other promised to comply with his request and brought him one morning to the church where they heard mass. On leaving the church, the former said, Where is the friend who provides for you? The other answered, Did you not see Jesus Christ on the altar? He is the friend who supports me. Thus, my brethren, he be assured that it is God alone and not sin that provides for us. He provides for all who observe his law and not for those who despise it. It is right that all should know, many already know in it, know it, that in 1748, Benedict XIV permitted the inhabitants of the kingdom of Naples and Sicily to work on all holidays except on the Sundays and principal feast, but did not exempt them from the obligation of hearing mass. The festival in which they are not allowed to work are all Sundays, Christmas Day, and circum the Circumcision, the Epiphany, Ascension Day, Corpus Christi, the Festivals of the Conception, Nativity, Annunciation, Purification, and Assumption of the Most Holy Mary. The Feast of St. Peter and Paul and of all saints and of all the principal patrons of every city or town in the diocese. In the United States, all Sundays in the year, circumstances, circumcision, of, and these are just listed of obligations. I'm going to skip that. Second, the obligation of hearing Mass. It is a sacrifice which is offered to the divine majesty of the body and blood of Jesus Christ under the appearance of bread and wine. How should one hear Mass? To satisfy the obligation of hearing Mass, two things are necessary, an intention and attention. It is necessary to have an intention of hearing Mass so that the man who is forced into church against his will or who enters only to look about him and see the place or to wait there for a friend or for any other purpose except hearing Mass does not fulfill the obligation. But should a person hear Mass through devotion, believing that he, the day is not a holiday, is he bound when he finds that it is a holiday to hear another Mass? No. It's enough to have done the work commanded without having adverted the intention of fulfilling the precept of hearing Mass. It is necessary to hear Mass with attention, that is, to attend the sacrifice that is celebrated. This intention may be external and internal. It's, it is certain that a person who hears Mass without external attention does not fulfill his obligation. For example, if during the Mass you are asleep or are drunk or employed in writing, talking, or external operations, you do not fulfill the precepts of hearing Mass. It is disputed among theologians whether a person who attends Mass without internal intention satisfies his obligation. That is, if he sees what is going on, but is at the same time interiorly distracted and employed in not thinking, and thinking not on God, but on other things. Many theologians say that he is guilty of a venial, but not of a grievous sin, as often as he is voluntarily distracted, and that he fulfills the substance of the precept because he hears Mass with a moral presence. But the greater number of theologians following St. Thomas teach that a person does not fulfill the obligation of hearing Mass, namely when he is conscious that he is distracted and not attending to the Mass and positively wishes to continue in his distraction. Hence, I exhort you in hearing Mass to reflect on the great sacrifice which is being offered. And meditate on the passion of Jesus Christ, for the Mass is a renewal of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ offered on the cross. Or meditate on some eternal truth, on death, the judgment, or hell. Let him who knows how to read make use of some little book, or let him recite the office of the Blessed Virgin. Let those who cannot read, if they will meditate, say the rosary or some other vocal prayers. Let them at least attend to what the priest is doing. Does a person who makes his confession during Mass satisfy the obligation of hearing Mass? No, for then he would attend it as a criminal accusing himself of his sins and not as a person offering sacrifice. It is certain that all who hear Mass offer sacrifice along with the priest. Hence, it would be advisable during Mass to offer the holy sacrifice for the ends to which it was instituted. The Mass was instituted in order to honor God, to thank Him, to obtain the satisfaction for sins, and to obtain the grace we stand in need of. 
During the Mass, then, we ought first to offer to God the sacrifice of His Son in honor of His divine majesty. Secondly, in thanksgiving for all the benefits we have received from Him. Thirdly, in satisfaction for our sins. And fourthly, to implore of God, through the merits of Jesus Christ, the grace is necessary for our salvation. At the elevation of the host, let us ask God to pardon our sins for the sake of Jesus Christ. At the elevation of the child, let us beg of God, through the merits of the divine blood, the gift of his love and holy perseverance. And during the communion of the priest, let us make a spiritual communion, saying, My Jesus, I desire to receive thee, I embrace thee, do not permit me to be separated from thee. What sin is there when one is absent from a part of Mass? There are several other things that must be noticed. First, he who is absent from a considerable part of the Mass is guilty of mortal sin. But what part of Mass is to be regarded as considerable? According to some theologian, the person who is present from the beginning of the offertory or the secret prayer, which the priest says after the gospel, to the end of Mass is not guilty of mortal sin. Because, as St. Isidore writes in ancient times, the Mass began with the offertory. However, the more probable and more common opinion is that it is grievous sin to be absent from the beginning of Mass to the end of the first gospel. But it is commonly taught that a person who is absent from the beginning of the Mass to the epistle, or during the part of the Mass that follows the communion of the priest, does not sin mortally. I say that he who is not present at the consecration or at the communion of the priest does not satisfy the obligation of hearing Mass. In the second place, take notice that Innocent XI condemned a proposition which asserted that the obligation of hearing Mass is fulfilled by being present at the half of two Masses celebrated at the same time, but by two different priests. But it is the obligation fulfilled by a person who hears the half of the two Masses successively, that is, the half of a Mass celebrated by one priest and another half of the Mass afterwards celebrated by a different priest. Many theologians answer in the affirmative, provided the person is present at the consecration and communion of the same Mass. Where shall one be to hear Mass? I think I'll skip that question, where the cause is an excuse for obligation to hearing Mass. If you're sick, you can't attend Mass. If you're morally impossible, one cannot go to the church without exposing himself to danger, some grievous temporal or spiritual evil. Hence, the persons of gone guards in cities or in armies or entrusted with the care of herds or cattle or houses or of infants or the sick are exempt from the obligation of hearing mass when they have no person to take their place. Any grievous inconvenience is also an excusing cause. Hence, the sick who are convalescent and unable to go to the church without great pain or danger of relapse are excused from the obligation of hearing mass. Also, servants who cannot leave the house without grievous inconvenience to their master or to themselves who, for example, if they left the house would be in danger of being dismissed or would scarcely be able to get employment from others. A notable distance from the church, theologians say three miles, is sufficient excuse. A less distance, distance excuses from sin when it is raining or snowing or when a person is infirm or in the road to the church is very bad. In those places where it is prevalent, the custom of the not leaving the house for some time after childbirth or after the death of a near relative is a sufficient excuse for not hearing Mass but some absent themselves from the church and go to public places. Such persons are not excused by the custom of that place from hearing Mass. Persons may sometimes be excused by want of clothes or by the means of appearing in church in a manner suited to their condition. But if there be a chapel in the neighborhood in which Mass is celebrated at an early hour, they are bound to go there and hear Mass. My dear Christians, why? My dear Christians, would that I could persuade you all to hear Mass every day? Oh, how great a treasure is a Mass to all who hear it with devotion and piety. Besides the indulgences which are granted for hearing Mass, great graces are obtained. The fruits of passion of Jesus Christ are applied to everyone that hears Mass. For as I have already said, each person who hears Mass, for as I have, uh, each person who hears Mass offers a sacrifice along with the priest and offers to God for himself and for others the death of all the merits of the Savior. Okay. I will skip the rest of this. I'll leave the link here for if you want to follow along or read the rest of it. Uh, let's see. The Let's skip the rest of Alphonsus' uh, commentary on the third commandment. And let's go to the moral handbook from, the, uh, from Prumer. Prumer is a Dominican theologian who wrote uh, on many, many topics. And he is considered the guy to go to for questions on moral theology. So I'll be reading some of his work here. This article is divided into three paragraphs. One, the nature, origin, utility of this worship. Two, the precepts of hearing mass. 
the first part of this worship. The third, prohibition of servile work. The second part of this worship. In this article will be included everything prescribed by the first of the Ten Commandments and by the first commandment of the church. Nature, origin, and utility of sanctifying feast days. Nature and origin. The precepts of sanctifying Sundays and holy days is partially natural law, partly divine positive law, and partly ecclesiastic law. It belongs to natural law insofar as it commands a specific time to be devoted to the public worship of God. The divine positive law commands rest from all forms of servile work one day each week for the purpose of giving praise to the Creator, and this is a probable opinion. See, the precept is a part of ecclesiastical law insofar as the church alone has decided on which days and in what way God is to be worshipped. The extent of the precept. Who are obliged by the precept? All baptized persons who have reached the age of seven and have the use of reason. Even heretics are bound to observe this precept, but transgressors are frequently excused from formal sin through ignorance. Second, which days are to be kept holy? By common law and according to pre- present discipline, all Sundays and following ten feasts are days of obligation. I'm not going to read them all. By local law, some of these feasts are excluded and others have been added. The Feast of St. James in Spain, for example. What does ecclesiastical law require on Sundays and holy days? Two things, a hearing of mass and resting from servile and public work. The utility of the precept, man's natural powers are rested. Valuable help is given to man's spiritual and religious life. Family life is fostered, and social worship and universal religion are encouraged. Second, the precept of hearing Mass. The gravity and extent of this precept. All baptized persons who have reached the age of seven have the use of reason are obliged under penalty of serious sin to hear Mass on Sundays and holy days. Thus, imbeciles and children who have not yet attained to the use of reason are excluded from this precept. Children who attain the use of reason before the age of seven are not strictly bound to assist at Mass since ecclesiastic law does not bind them. A priest who celebrates Mass, even in a private oratory, satisfies this precept. For the perfect fulfillment of the precept, four things are required, bodily presence, the entire Mass, devout assistance, and a proper place. Bodily presence is considered sufficient if the person hearing Mass is morally united to the celebrant. Therefore, the following satisfy their obligation. All who are in the church itself, even if they are in a side chapel and cannot see the celebrant, provided that by the sound of the bell or by adverting by the attention of others, they realize to some extent what is being done by the celebrant. Even those who stand outside the church close to the door, even if it is shut, or who are in some neighboring building, provided that they have some view of the ceremonies and unite themselves with the celebrant. The entire Mass must be heard from the beginning of Mass up to and including the priest's blessing. On those days which the priest celebrates three Masses, the faithful are not obliged to hear more than one Mass. Whoever omits a notable part of the Mass does not satisfy the precept and thereby commits grave sin. What constitutes a notable part is not easily determined. Two points are agreed. What constitutes a notable part is to be decided not merely from the length of time, but more especially from the dignity of the omitted parts. Thus, a person who is absent for the consecration and the communion, even though he may be present for the rest of Mass, does not fulfill the precept. A third part of the Mass constitutes a notable part and is regarded as grave matter. The following are looked upon as slight omissions, everything from the beginning of Mass until the offertory, exclusively, all that follow the communion, everything from the beginning from until the epistle, together with all that follows the communion, gay through communion. C. A devout and not merely physical assistance is necessary during Mass. Thus, there are required a right intention of worshiping God. Therefore, a man comes to church merely to listen to the music or to meet some girl does not satisfy the precept. B. Proper attention. It is disputed whether internal attention is required in addition to external attention. The necessary attention would seem to be lacking if a person were to be in the confessional for the whole of Mass or during a notable part. Therefore, unless genuine need excuses them, some penitents would be obliged to hear another Mass. Often, however, there does not exist such a need as, for example, in the case of domestic servants or those who cannot go to confession at any other time. The proper place for hearing Mass is normally a church or a public or semi-public oratory. A public oratory is a place permanently set aside by the authority of the ordinary for public worship. And this, I will skip ahead, cases which excuse someone from fulfilling his obligation. 
the physical and moral impossibility. And then they here he just quotes Alphonsus, which I just read to you. Prohibis- prohibition of servile work. Distinctions. There are four types of work. Servile work, which requires a mainly bodily activity. Ha- B has its Im- immediate purpose, the welfare of the body. C was formerly done by slaves, farm work such as digging or plowing, mechanical work like sewing or making shoes. The character of servile work is not determined by the worker's intention or by the fatigue involved or by the fact that wages are received, but solely by the nature of the work itself, which remains servile even if done out of charity or for one's sake of recreation. Cultural work is that which A is product chiefly of the mental faculties, B is immediately directed toward the development of the mind, C, used to perform, is to be performed by persons who were not slaves, such as reading, writing, singing, playing the organ. These acts remain cultural, even if energy is lost in their performance and wages received. Third, ordinary, natural work, is the work that is done indiscriminately by all classes and is chiefly intended by the daily sustenance of the body, such as eating, hunting, traveling, cooking. Fourth, judicial and commercial work is the work that is transacted in the courts or in the course of building trading, such as sitting in court, defending criminals, buying, selling, leasing. There are forms of work whose exact nature remain in doubt. In order to solve such doubts, one should be guided by the common opinion of men. Thus, for example, a rowing is servile work, but common opinion regards it as lawful on Sunday if done for the sake of recreation. All servile and judicial and commercial work is forbidden on Sundays and holy days, but cultural and ordinary work is allowed. Any form of servile, judicial, or commercial work prevents man from giving sufficient attention to the worship of God, since it absorbs the attention of the mind and tires his body. Other forms of work do not have the same effect. A more lenient attitude towards a commercial work is at present in existence, since markets are allowed for the sale of small articles such as flowers or fruits, and private contracts of buying or selling are also permitted. The prohibition of servile and judicial work is gray, but allows a parvity of matter. It is thought that servile work lasting for more than two hours, either continuously or with intervals, without any excusing cause, constitutes grave matter, and is therefore grievously sinful. But if the work is light in character rather than servile, a space of three hours is considered necessary before the grave matter exists. Causes which excuse from the precept can be reduced to three types, personal need or that of another, legitimate custom, and legitimate dispensation. Personal need or that of another sometimes excuses from this precept as, for example, farmers during harvest time, the poor domestic servants, workers responsible for the maintenance of machines in factories. Some necessity is thought to exist if there is danger of sinning as a result of idleness. Custom is certain places, excuses hairdressers, drivers of public vehicles, hunters, fishers, those who sell small articles. A dispensation in this law may be granted by the Holy See and also in particular cases by bishops, religious prelates, parish priests for their own parishioners. A confessor has no power to dispense in this matter, but in doubtful cases he may interpret the law and allow his penitents to undertake necessary work. Okay, that was from Prumer, and I will leave a link to that as well in the description. Let's see, I will read St. Thomas, and this video is getting much longer than I thought it would be, so I'll skip the Council of Trent. If I have time, I might come back to it, because I really want to get to John Vianney, so I don't want this to go longer than like 50 minutes, so let's see. This is St. Thomas on it. His isn't too, too long, though it is a little long keep holy the sabbath day this is their third command of the law and it very suitably is it is so for we are first commanded to adore god in our hearts and the commandment is to worship one god you shall not have strange gods before me in the second commandment we are told to reverence god by word you shall take the name of the lord your god in vain you shall not take the lord the name god in name of the lord your god in vain the third commandment us to reverence third commands us to reverence god by act it is remember that you keep holy the sabbath day god wished that a certain day be set aside on which men direct their minds to the service of the lord there are five reasons for this commandment the first reason was to put aside error for the holy spirit saw that in some future some men would say that the world has always existed in the last days there shall come deceitful scoffers walking after their own lust saying where is his promise of his coming 
For since the time that the Father slept, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this are willfully ignorant of, that the heavens were before, the earth out of water, and through water created by the word of God. God therefore wished that one day should be set aside in memory of the fact that he created all things in six days, and that on the seventh day he rested from the creation of new creatures. This is why the Lord placed the commandment of the law, saying, Remember that you keep holy the Sabbath day. The Jews kept holy the Sabbath in memory of the first creation, but Christ, as at his coming, brought about a new creation, for the first creation of an earthly man was created, and by the second a heavenly man was formed. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision is worth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. This new creation is through grace which came by the resurrection." that as Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in a newness of life. For we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, so shall we also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And thus, because the resurrection took place on a Sunday, we celebrate that day, even as the Jews observe the Sabbath on account of the first creation. The second reason for this commandment is to instruct us in our faith, in the, in the Redeemer. For the flesh of Christ was not corrupted in the sepulcher, and thus it is said, Moreover, my flesh also shall rest in hope, nor will you let your Holy One see corruption. Wherefore God wished the Sabbath that should be observed, and the just of the sacrifice of the old law signified the death of Christ, so should the quiet of the Sabbath signify the rest of his body in the sepulcher. But we do not now observe these sacrifices, because with the advent of the reality and the truth, figures of it must cease." Just as the darkness is dispelled with the rising sun, nevertheless we kept that Saturdays in veneration of the Blessed Virgin, in whom remain a firm faith on that Saturday while Christ was dead. The third reason is that this commandment was given to strengthen and foreshadow the fulfillment of the promise of rest. For rest indeed was promised to us, and on that day God shall give you rest from your labor, from your vexation, and from the hard bondage to which you have been subjugated. My people shall dwell in a peaceful land and in secure accommodations and in a quiet place of rest. We hope from the rest from these three things, from the labor of the present life, from the struggles of temptation, and from the servitude of the devil, Christ promised this rest to all those who will come to him. Come to me, all ye who are labored, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, because I am meek and humble of heart, and you shall find rest to your souls. For my yoke is sweet and my burden light. However, the Lord, as we know, worked for six days, and on the seventh he rested, because it is necessary to do perfect work. Behold, your eyes, how I have labored a little, and have found much rest to myself. For the period of eternity exceeds the present time incomparably more than a thousand years exceeding one day. Fourthly, this command which was given for the increase of our love. And I'm going to skip the rest of this and skip over to what is forbidden. Remember that you keep holy the Sabbath day. We have already said that as the Jews celebrated the Sabbath, so we Christians observe the Sunday and all principal feast. Let us now see in what way we should keep these days. We ought to know that God did not say to keep the Sabbath, but to remember to keep it holy. The word holy may be taken in two ways. Sometimes holy, sanctified, is the same as pure. But you are washed, but you are sanctified, that is made holy. Then again, at times holy is said of a thing consecrated to the worship of God. For instance, a place, a season, vestments, the holy vessels. Therefore, in these two ways, we ought to celebrate the feast. That is, both purely and by giving ourselves over to divine service. We shall consider two things regarding the commandment. First, that we should be avoided, that what should be avoided on a feast day. Secondly, what we should do. We ought to avoid three things. The first is servile work. Avoidance of servile work, nothing do, neither do any work, sanctify the Sabbath day. And so also it is said in the law, you shall not do servile work therein. Now servile work is bodily work, whereas free work is done by the mind. For instance, the exercise of the intellect and such like. And one cannot be servilely bound to do this kind of work when servile work is lawful. We ought to know, however, that servile work can be done on the Sabbath for four reasons. The first is necessity, wherefore the Lord excused the disciples plucking the ears of corn on the Sabbath, as we read in St. Matthew. The second reason is that is when the work is done for the service of the church, as we see in the same gospel, how the priest did all things necessary in the temple on the Sabbath day. The third reason is for the good of our neighbor, for on the Sabbath the Savior cured one having a withered hand, and he refuted the Jews who reprimanded him by citing example of the sheep in a pit. And the fourth reason is the authority of our superiors, 
Thus, God commanded the Jews to circumcise on the Sabbath. Avoidance of sin and negligence on the Sabbath. Another thing to be avoided on the Sabbath is sin. Take heed to your souls and carry no burden on the Sabbath. That this weight and burden is on the soul is sin. My iniquities as a, as a heavy burden are becoming heavy upon me. Now sin is servile work because whoever commits sin is a servant of sin. Therefore, when it is said you shall not do servile work therein, it can be understood to have sin. Thus one violates his commandment as often as one commits sin on the Sabbath. And so both by working and by sin, God is offended. The Sabbaths and the other festivals I will not abide. And why? Because your assemblies are wicked. My soul hates your new moon and your solemnities, and they are become troublesome to me. Another thing to avoid on the Sabbath is idleness, for idleness has taught much evil. St. Jerome says, always do some good work, and the devil will always find you occupied. Hence, it is not good for one to keep only the principal feast of one, of on the other principal feast if on the others one would remain idle the king's honor loves judgment and this is to say discretion wherefore we read the certain of the jews were in hiding and their enemies fell upon them but they believing that they were not able to defend themselves on the sabbath were overcome and killed the same thing happens to those who are idle on feast days the enemies have seen her and have mocked at her sabbaths and all such should do as those jews did of whom it is said whoever shall come up against us to fight on the sabbath we will fight against them. And I will skip the rest because the rest is about, um, I'll skip the part of the mass because we've covered that already. Secondly, we should offer our bodies by mortifying it with fasting. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And do not forget to do good and to impart. We should sacrifice our possessions and by giving alms. And this alms ought to be more than on other days because the Sabbath is a day of common joys. That's interesting. Contemplation of divine things, hearing of God's word. And I'll leave that there. Okay, we're 42 minutes in. I am going to skip the Catechism of Council of Trent. We'll skip the Bible because, I mean, we've quoted that already. Pius XII says, How will those Christians not fear spiritually death, spiritual death when rest on Sunday and feast days is not devoted to religion and piety, but given over to allurement of the world? Sundays and holy days must be made holy by divine worship which give homage to God and heavenly food to the soul. Our souls is filled with the greatest grief when, see, when, they, when we see how the Christian people profane the afternoon of feast days. Our Lady of La Salette said, Six days I have given you to labor, the seventh I have kept for myself, and they will not give it to me. It is this which makes the arm of my son so heavy. She continues on saying, There are none who go to Mass except a few aged women. The rest work on Sunday all summer, that in the winter, when they know not what to do, they go to Mass only to mock at religion. If they're in lit, they go to the meat market like dogs. All right, finally, I want to conclude with uh, St. John Vianney because this was sermons of St. John Vianney. And I thought they were very relatable. And they're very, um, how do you say, very pastoral. So St. John Vianney says, the lukewarm Christians may not perhaps work on Sunday at task, which seem to be forbidden to anyone who has ever even the slightest shred of religion. But, do, but doing some sewing, arranging something in the house, driving sheep to the fields during the times for masses, on the pretext there is not enough food to give them. All these things will be done without the slightest scruple, and such people will prefer to allow their souls and the souls of their employees to perish rather than endanger their animals. A man will busy himself getting out his tools and his carts and harrows and so on for the next day. He will fill in a hole or a fence or a gap. He will cut various lengths of cut cords and ropes. He will carry out the churns and set them in order. What do you think about all this, my brethren? It is not, alas, the simple truth. But now we shall, make, try, make, we shall try to make them understand things a little better, at least if they want to. But being deaf and blind as they are, it is very difficult to make them understand the words of life or to comprehend their own unhappy state. To begin with, they never make the sign of the cross before a meal or say grace afterwards, nor do they, do they recite the Angelus if, as a result of some old habit or training, they still observe these practices you, and you should happen to see the manner in which they carry them out, you would feel sick. The women will simultaneously be getting on with their work or calling to their children or members of the household. The men will be turning a hat or a cap around in their heads as if searching for holes. 
They think as much about God as if they really believe that he did not exist at all and that they were doing all this for a joke. They have no scruples about buying or selling on the holy days of Sunday, even though they know, or at least they should know, that dealing on a reasonably big scale on a Sunday, when there is no necessity for it, is a mortal sin. Such people regard all such facts as trifles. They will go into a parish on a holy day to hire laborers, and if you told them that they were doing wrong, they would reply, we must go when we can find some find them there. They have no God, they have no God forbid swearing. Alas, what quarrels, what swearing, what blasphemies are uttered at a result of the jealousy that arises between these young people and at such gatherings? Have you not often disputes or fights there? Who could count the crimes that are committed of these diabolical gatherings? That third commandment commands us to sanctify the holy day of Sunday. Can anyone really believe that a boy who has passed several hours with a girl whose heart is like a furnace is really thus satisfied this precept? St. Augustine has good reason to say that men would be better to work their little lands and girls to carry on with their spinning than to go dancing. The evil would be less. Skipping ahead, but you will say to me, who are these people who are partly on God's side and partly on the side of the world? Well, my dear children, let me describe them. I will compare them, if I may dare to make use of the term, to dogs who will run to the first person who calls them. You may follow them from the morning to the evening, from the beginning of the year to the end. These people look upon Sunday as merely a day for rest and amusement. They stay in bed longer than on weekdays, and instead of giving themselves to God with all their hearts, they do not even think of him. Some of them will be thinking of other amusements, others of people they expect to meet, still others of the sales they are about to make or the money they are spending or receiving. With great difficulty, they will manage the sign of the cross in some fashion or another. Because they will be going to church later, they will omit their prayers altogether, saying, Oh, I'll have plenty of time to say them before Mass. They always have something to do before setting out for Mass, and although they have been planning to say their prayers before setting out, they are barely in time for the beginning of Mass itself. If they meet a friend along the road, it is no trouble to them to bring him back home to put off the Mass until a later hour. With dispositions like that, how many sins must be committed during the services? How many people must commit more sins on Sunday than the, during the, all the rest of the week? No, my dear children, we, never, we need never fear that, ma that the Mass hinders us in the fulfillment of our temporal affairs. It is altogether the other way around. We may be sure that all will be better and that even our businesses will succeed better than if we have the misfortune not to assist at Mass. Here is a splendid example of that. It concerns two artisans who belonged to the same trade and who lived in the same little town. One of them, who had a very large family and never missed hearing mass every day, lived very comfortably by his trade. But the other, on the contrary, who had no family, worked all day and part of the night and very often on the holy day of Sunday, still had the greatest difficulty in the world making ends meet. The, la the latter, when he saw how well things were going for the other man, asked him one day when he met him how he managed to make enough to maintain so comfortably a family as large as his. As for himself, he said, although there were only his wife and himself, and he never stopped working, he was often short of everything. The other replied that if he so wished, he would show him the following day where he made his profit. Delighted with such good news, this unsuccessful artisan could hardly wait until the following day so that he might learn how to make his fortune. True to his word, his friend called to him, so there he was, setting off in great heart and full of confidence, following his friend who brought him to church where they heard Mass. A f and I'm skipping this, the rest of the story because you kind of see where it's going. A father thinks that it is quite enough to maintain good order in his house. He will not have anyone swearing or using obscene words. That is very good, but he has no scruples about allowing his boys to go to amusements, to fairs, and all sorts of pleasure like that. This same father permits work to be done on Sundays, on the slightest pretext, even such as not to go against the wishes of his reapers or his threshers. However, you see him in church adoring God, even prostrating before him. He is trying to avoid the slightest distraction, but tell me, my friends, how do you suppose God looks upon such people as that? Carry on, my poor friend. You are blind. Go and learn your duties, and then you may come to offer your praises to God. Do you not see that you are doing the work of Pontius Pilate, who recognized Jesus Christ, and who yet condemned him? Okay, I would love to go over this one, but I don't think I have time to go over this. Let's see, if I only do this part, maybe it would... 
let be enough time, maybe. Okay. Sins against the third commandment. So I'll skip to here. The precepts enjoined upon us to sanctify the Sunday is transgressed. By the way, this is a catechism explained by Father Spogaro. He explains the Roman catechism, the catechism, the Council of Trent. By doing or requiring others to perform servile work, the Christian ought to allow his servants and even his cattle to rest on the Sunday. Servants, apprentices, and all those who are in subordinate positions ought not to remain in a situation where they cannot fulfill their ob- religious obligations. Servile work is a mortal sin if it be done for more than two or three hours on Sunday without urgent necessity. Yet hard work, if done for a shorter time or light work for the same time, is not mortal sin, nor it is nor is it if it's not val- very valid reason is counted on as an excuse. Nor again, if a servant does what his master without cogent grounds requires of him through fear of evil consequences to himself. In the latter case, the sin rests with the master. If scandal is given by doing servile work, even for a short time, it is a grievous sin. Our Lord says of one who gives scandal, it would be better for a millstone should be hanged about his neck and cast into the sea. God threatened the Jews with emphatically saying, most emphatically saying that anyone who profaned the Sabbath should be put to death. He that shall do any work in it, his soul shall perish out of the midst of his people. Second, by carelessness about attendance at public worship, entertainment given on Saturday are often the cause why Catholics omit mass on Sunday. What folly exclaims St. Francis Sells to turn day into night and night into day and neglect one's duties for frivolous amusements. Third, by indulging in diversions which are over fatiguing or which are his sinful nature. Games which involve much physical exertion, hunting, dancing, etc., ought to be avoided on Sunday. Also, those which lead to things unseemly, brawls, extravagant expenditure, disin- disinclination for work. Worse still, if the amusements are sinful in themselves, for whosoever commits sin and this is the servant of sin, and thus serve our work of the most degrading description is done. Woe to him who chooses the day which is consecrated to divine service to offend God against God and injure his own soul most deeply. Some people take advantage of the day of rest to indulge more freely in vice. Not unfrequently, the devil leaves people in peace all the week, and when Sunday comes, he tempts them to all manner of sin, pride, and austernation in dress, gambling, dancing, excess in eating and drinking. In the present day, men seem to think most of the eating and drinking of the Lord's day. Women of the adorning their persons. How lamentable is the depravity of mankind in thus abusing the most sacred institutions. On Sunday, the devil uh, devil of avarice is cast out. But it is as if seven others and worse devils entered in its place. The love of the world and all it entails. And all it entails. The frequenting of convivial scenes. Disservance of the tides of family life squanderings of savings and dislike of work. It is far better, St. Augustine says, that one should occupy oneself with needlework or fieldwork on Sunday than indulge in vice. To spend the Lord's day in worldly vanities amount to a kind of sacrilege. To desecrate it by sin is worse than plundering the sanctuary. Okay. I will leave it there because now this is just a lot to cover. Uh, Not enough time to do it all. I don't want to be here for two hours. So that'll conclude today's episode on that topic. I hope it was helpful. If it, if you want to hear more, for uh, I can do that. I will find more saints and more uh, catechisms and the like and read them to you on this topic. Because, yeah, I mean, this is a complicated topic. I mean, it's an easy topic, but whenever you start getting into the minutia, then it becomes pretty complicated and difficult. So use your prudence and ask your pastor. But... Yeah, let me know what you think. Comment down below. All right, like, subscribe. Make sure to comment down below. Hit the bell notification. Share this with a friend. And I will close out with an Ave Maria as usual. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostrae. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.